excited to talk about organizational culture with you beautiful people. Um, but before we jump in, please let me welcome you both. So uh, please let me welcome Karen John Madsen, uh, Principal of Co-Design of Work Experience, author of Culture Your Culture, Innovative Experiences at Work. Karen is an advisor, a consultant, a coach, an author, speaker, and an educator, and is known to be a versatile leader across multiple industries with experience leading in implementing organizational cultures initiatives around the globe. So welcome, Karen. It's nice to have you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And then, of course, oh, they, <laughs> of course, uh, we've been just talking up a storm beforehand, so it's kind of an odd one that we're going back and kind of introducing ourselves when we, we've been already having a time. So, <laughs> But uh, I would also like to welcome Evan Hanover. He is the Research Director at Conifer Research in Chicago, Illinois. And with a Master's of Anthropology and an expert in consumer research, Evan is known to explore human behavior holistically and at an eye level. I am Sharday Torgerson, the creative and digital strategist here at Incitrix Research in Saskatoon, Canada, and your season three host of the Stories and Market Research, the Incitrix podcast. Now, listen, this topic is fully loaded and fully baked for our listeners, and I literally cannot wait to dive in. But I think before we get too deep into it, I want to talk a little bit about organizational culture. Now, I think the whole f- uh, term is kind of fun to throw around in a room of people and attempt to get everyone to kind of agree <laughs> what exactly culture, workplace culture, organizational culture, corporate culture, what have you it is. Now, I'm going to leave this open for discussion for everyone, but I'm curious, what are we talking about when we're talking about work culture? And really what we're talking about is when we're talking about the realness behind everything is done in business. So, you know, what are we meaning when we say workplace culture is real? Uh, well, Chardet, thanks for having us. Um, you've asked a question that has been plaguing my discipline, anthropology, um, for, well, since its inception. Um, I, I don't think there is a single agreed upon uh, definition of what culture is. And I don't get too hung up on that. But I think there is a lot to be learned and a lot of benefit to be had by going beyond simply saying we're an innovative culture, we're a, we're a startup culture, we're an entrepreneurial culture. I think what culture is, is all of the background um, practices, values, uh, traditions, language that exists within an organization that kind of shape people's interactions, shape their expectations, help shape their collaboration, um, help shape the way they see the, um, their future and their trajectories within a given workplace. And the reason I love doing organizational culture work is that organizational cultures are fully realized. There are little rites and rituals that, that go on, whether it's simply, uh, I don't know, a Friday afternoon happy hour to help bond people, um, the daily gossip by the coffee machine, the, the proverbial water cooler. Um, but there are interaction types. Um, there is the formal like office meeting interaction. There's the, the all hands meeting interaction. There are the informal interactions that go on in the hallway or more, more likely now on Slack or, or Zoom, stuff like that. There is language and jargon that marks people as longstanding members of a company. Uh, and and newbies or outsiders um there are the espoused values there are how those values are um actually play out on the ground um, like i said there's those life trajectories there's sort of statuses and, and and political relationships and and so all of the things you find outside of uh, a an in-person or virtual corporate office like out in the world when we think about culture all exist within uh, companies and all of that goes to affect how people perform, stay engaged, um, stay employed at a given company. So, which we will get into, I have a feeling, quite a bit. Now it's here, Karen's totally different definition. <laughs> no, it's not totally different. I, I, I'm curious. Well, you know, I, I think Evan. No, it's not completely different. We just have, um, you know, our ways of defining it. And, and that's because you're right, Evan, there is no universally accepted definition. And so therefore, when we all do our work, and this is a great idea for you uh, that Charday actually asked us to start here, because 
it's important to state it up front so we know <laughs> what we're talking about, right? Um, so from my perspective, and I'm just going to layer on top of what Evan said, you know, culture is a social construct and it's reflected in all the things that have the power to influence uh, behaviors, interactions, people's perceptions. Um, and it really communicates, you know, what's acceptable and not acceptable. And it shows up in how people behave, interact, react and perceive reality. Right. So it's something that's created you know, and reinforced and experienced. And this is where I, I really see, uh, I resonate with Evan's definition is the experience of culture. So it's not what people say, it's what re really what people do and what they live through. Um, and so, you know, if, if you look at what those social boundaries look like, that's therein lies your culture, right? And so there's a lot of misconceptions about it out there, and I could talk all day about it, but, but I think what's, what's really important when we're talking about organizations is that it's either an asset or a liability, whether or not you're paying attention to it. <laughs> and so that's kind of my soapbox. I'm going to get on that soapbox probably a few times here, but that's, that's the big thing is that it's not always uh, culture-led in organizations when in fact it should be because it's the thing behind everything in my opinion. Right. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I think there's one more, uh, oh, there's a lot of more, a lot more aspects to it. But the other thing is it's, it's dynamic. It is like <laughs> culture, culture is not an artifact. It isn't yeah. frozen in time. And right. um, Karen talked about a, a little bit about how it's, it's, it's lived, it's embodied, it's practiced. And because it's practiced, it is sort of constantly out there and being iterated on in the world, and and a lot of those a lot of those changes might not be perceptible, but some of them are bigger, and you see them when um, if there is some sort of scandal, uh, companies sort of refocus on culture when there's a leadership change, and it so happens when there is a pandemic and people become dispersed because culture is also often. Um, practiced and embodied and reproduced in a space. And so when that space fundamentally changes, all of the other things fundamentally change, which I think is a lot of what we're going to talk about today um, is understanding that change. But it's important to know that like um, that this is something that is it's alive. It absolutely is. It's yeah. organic. It's evolving. And this is the thing, Evan, I wish people didn't have this perception that culture was happening to them. We're all mm -hmm. part of that ecosystem and we're contributing to and engaging with and shaping it through our own scope of influence. So uh, a lot of the work I do is trying to imp have people feel empowered to be and participate and to lead in the cultures within their organizations rather than saying, oh gosh, it happened it, it, and it's doing this to me and I can't change it. I can't touch it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, please, please continue on. I, I think that's an interesting point about it. People exteriorizing it and saying it's something that's out there because um, this has happened in every project I've done on organizational culture. And I, I suspect this will resonate with Karen as well, which is that um, people talk about, let's say you're working for, you know, uh, what's the stereotypical Acme company. People will say that's the Acme way. I think it's very common for people to explain away um, potentially negative behaviors by saying that's the Acme way if they work for, you know, if we're in a yeah. Wiley Coyote organizational culture study, um, <laughs> that people will say this is the Acme way and it's out there, but you're, you, you know, it's not that it's your fault, but you're living the Acme way. You contribute to the Acme way. And I think understanding that it is, um, top down, bottom up, left to right, right to left is, is really is really important for not only understanding it, but then trying to figure out like how do you how do you harness it and change it in a positive way? Yeah. I like that. I, I, if I, if I may, I think we're talking about two 
uh, almost like workplace culture needs to happen from the background and into the forefront. So, I mean, let's continue to roll on that. So workplace culture really needs to happen from the background to the forefront, right? So what does that look like when businesses are really implementing something like that? I mean, even on a high level, surface level, you know, perfect world, um, or what does it look like when businesses aren't, um, you know, uh, contributing their organizational culture from the background to the forefront? Um I think one of the things that you need to do is is recognize um, that the background isn't always articulatable, right? You can't always explain culture. We already talked about how we couldn't really define it that well. I mean, I think we were able to identify a lot of the markers that work together, um, but explaining how the whole works is, is in any concise way is is a, a long and actually probably at the end of the day a pretty tedious podcast um but but i think you need to understand that like okay there are all these things that that shape the way like karen said you develop a sense that this is the right or the wrong way to do something the acceptable and the unacceptable way um the way that is understood and is kind of like um legible to the organization and ways that aren't um, so there may be a kind of way of creating a deliverable. And if the organization has a, has, has a particular way of saying like, this is how knowledge is produced inside of our organization. This is how we use it. This is how we digest it. That is, that is a cultural practice fundamentally. And even if it ends up being delivered in a different form, people may still understand it, but it is not ultimately valued in the same way. Um, I can, yeah. so I'm going to drift off into a, a little bit of my anthropological background. And I, and I have a, some thoughts on that too. So uh, <laughs> um, do, do you want to jump or should I? Uh, no, um, finish your thought. I don't want you to lose it. Um, one of my favorite articles, which I, which I give a lot of my young anthropologists who get hired at Conifer to read, is by a woman named Carol Cohn, uh, C-O-H-N, who I believe was a sociologist. And I could get you a link to the specific article, but it's something along the lines of uh, sex and death among defense intellectuals. And so in the 1980s, she was part of a program where social scientists were able to study to able to embed, I believe, at the Department of the Defense at the Pentagon. And she was listening, and this is the Cold War, and people are talking about all these war game scenarios. And she would try to engage the folks in discussions about the war game scenarios, which, you know, it's nuclear war, everybody dies, but yet somebody still wins. It didn't make any moral or logical sense. And she was largely ignored. And her gut reaction, which was not a bad gut reaction, was like, I'm in a, I, I'm, I'm in a world, I've entered a world of older men and they don't want to listen to a woman engage in this. Then she, she was like, let me try this. Let me start speaking in their jargon. <laughs> and it was the jargon itself. It was the accepted cultural practice of speaking in a particular register, a particular jargon that allowed her to become part of those conversations. Um, and what it does is it, it's, it's an example of how um, sometimes you need to clothe certain interactions in the, the language or the symbols of a place in order for those things to make sense within the place. It's not like the people didn't understand what she was talking about, but the, the culture there necessitated that she talk in a certain way. Now, there's more to it because there was an internal logic to that jargon, which allowed you to talk about uh, enormous casualties and still somehow win a war. But I think the, the point for us, because we're not uh, gaming out nuclear holocausts, is that is that <laughs> there are really salient aspects of a culture which you need to understand in order to work effectively within them. Yes. And so, Evan, what you're pointing out is the importance of context and how that's unique <clears throat> to every single individual organization, even if they're in the same business, the same industry, because every one of our organizations are made up of a unique combination of people. Now, therein lies the problem. I'm in 
the field that I'm in, there's so many interventions that are so-called best practices where we take the same things and then people expect it to function the same way. Mm-hmm. So all the work that I do in organizations are customized to the context. And that means including a deep understanding of the culture in which everything is happening. So Evan, I agree with you that you're, you're describing the challenges very accurately, but that's why my work exists, right? I'm here mm-hmm. to make culture overt. Um, intentional and continually leveraged because like I said, it's either working for or against people and their organizations today. And so to go back to your question, Sharda, is how does this show up? Um, You can have the best processes, the best strategies, the best goals, all the capital in the world. You're not going to achieve your full potential if you don't have the people part down. And guess what? Culture is a part of that, right? And we're seeing that so many examples of why culture has not served an organization in the news headlines, right? I don't want to out any particular ones because they happen every week, honestly. Like if we listen to all so there's a lot of examples out there of of where it's gone awry. And and to Evan's point earlier as well, is it changes. So a, a company can't declare victory when they see oh, well, we have evidence that we have a great culture. Okay, now we can pack up and go home because, (laughs) Um, and I said this earlier in the conversation, a coaching conversation today, it's relationships are like plants. If you don't water them, they'll die, right? So I heard that from a a professor at UCSF. And it was, a, a, I think it was a neuroscientist or, or a neurosurgeon that said that about how, I mean, he's examining, you know, the brain and our interactions from a totally different angle. But I, that analogy really stuck out to me because people don't realize Mm -hmm. that in organizations, your culture describes the relationship you have with your people, uh, like on a large, large scale. Right. And when we talk about culture change, it's got to create enough depth and breadth in order to be sustainable. Okay. So that means happening has to be happening at the individual the team and the organizational level. So I hope that answers your question, Sade, about how does it show up, you know, in the business? If a company is culture led like they are any other business asset, uh, they're yep. gonna have their ducks in a row, but most organizations do not. And there's research that says we know our culture sucks and we know it's because we underinvested in it. So we know <laughs> we know the problems there, and still we all know the answers on what to do and still the issue is an execution, right? So there we go. And I feel maybe the pandemic might have played an interesting role in even some of the culture shift that, that's happening today. And it's not to say that cultural shift hasn't been happening for many years within business. Uh, but I mean, come on, who predicted such an event in our lifetime? Um, I'm even thinking within our own respective organizations. So I'll, like I just, even with you guys talking, I'm going within my own, you know, unique personal experience when it comes to dealing with a shift in culture. And, and that shift really does seem like it's on the forefront front. You know, the whole nine to five work schedule is a whole lot less relevant uh, than ever it's ever felt. Um, we were even talking about it earlier, things like you you have co-location mm-hmm. environments, you have people remote working, uh, the hybrid work, a mash of companies are doing all these different things, but no one is really figuring it out or they are and maybe not sharing it to some degree. But I, I'm curious uh, what, what you guys think in terms of how maybe the whole concept of people work is changing and how that too might be affecting workplace culture. Ooh, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> that's the interview with in me. So well, I mean, if I could just jump in, um, I think we need to move from tactics to um, just a holistic integrated strategy. All right. So a lot of this, I'm all for experimenting. I'm all for iteration. I'm not saying no to that. That's all part of learning agility, right? So I want organizations to um, kind of refocus themselves around people and learning um, and co-creation, quite frankly, because this is about uh, creating the new employee experience of the future. And you can't just uh, legislate that, whatever you want to call it, Mm -hmm. uh, from from the -hmm. the ivory tower of leadership. And so I, I think it's, you see a lot of implementing tactics. Oh, they do that. Okay, we'll try that. Or let's try this. Oh, we changed our mind. Or so-and-so said that. Oh, I saw this somewhere else. And and it's all disjointed. And that's 
And because it's disjointed, guess what? That's what employees are experiencing as well, right? So uh, again, all these are reasons why I'm like, uh, I really, I can help you people (laughs) if you just wanted to look at it a little bit differently. Yeah, I I think... I think the first step in all of this, and, and in some ways this is obvious because it's the first step in research, is humility. I think it is we are so we are so future focused. What whatever you want to call it, what is the new normal going to be like? I hate the new normal, but um, what is a post pandemic world going to look like? What is you know what are the twenty twenties and twenty thirties going to look like? But I think the first thing to do is is to say I don't know. Like, cause, cause, because you don't. And as soon as you exhibit, and this is really important for leadership, because if leadership ex- exhibits and um, espouses and actually like walks the walk of humility, they're all of a sudden open to different answers. They are open to different solutions. They are going to be open to that co-creative process that's that's going to be so critical to effectively readjusting or re building in some places cultures so so that that's the the first thing the the second thing is i think regarding the pandemic the pandemic has kind of been like salt it's a flavor enhancer um it's it and by that i mean like it's taken a number of these trends that have been going on and really like kind of made them either pop or flat out just sort of explode pushed the bird out of and, the tree to see and, if it exactly fly, and so. and some of that some of that hybrid work some of that um you know a, a lot of the the sort of rhetoric and lip service around things like work life balance um which was always i think in part a marketing tool rather than an actual lived breathe thing um uh, some of the the idea of creating a workplace that was much more if not egalitarian, then co-creative. Um, all of those, all of those things, and all of those demands, and, and a lot of the things that we've heard about um, the generational differences be- between different kinds of workers, all of that has come to the, come to the fore because everything we knew was thrown into upheaval. And when you know, um, when you have a moment of great and broad disruption, you have reflection. Um, you have, you you talked a little bit about culture being in the background and whether it should be in the foreground. You have a lot of the things that you just assumed were the ways to do work, um, pushed to the foreground. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. this is going to be the way they communicate. This is the way we're going to structure our day. This is the kind of dress that is appropriate for a meeting. This is the, this is the way that, um, like time is structured. All of that stuff was completely disjointed. And now we have all this, all this to look at. And I think getting back to the people need to be like, like plants need to be watered or they die. I think a big part of that goes back to the idea that culture is practice. Um, and that you can't just, um, as Karen mentioned, you can't just you know, lean out of the tower of leadership and say like, our culture is now this, because that's not mm-hmm. a it's not a credible act, um, and it's really hard to know what that means. Like when you say, mm-hmm. you know, we are about um, we are about equity, and we are about like building a better tomorrow, and we are about this, we are about that. Like, what does that actually mean for us? Um, it means and, nothing if people don't experience right. it. Right. It, it, it is it, it is platitudes, <laughs> and people understand that it's platitudes, and that's and that's a lot of the people work that needs to be done, and which I suspect we're going to talk about in a second. Okay, which is yeah. like, what is that? What does it mean to involve um, a, a broad spectrum of people in understanding and projecting forward? Like, what could our culture be? Um, which is, which is a key part of both the work that that Karen and I have have done, and I think is absolutely essential. So, what do you want to know about it? I, I have so much to say to that, Charday. Is that okay? Yes. This is why I like, absolutely. This absolutely. is why I like talking with Evan. I mean, I think we build upon each other so easily. I could sit like this the whole time and really? just listen. And, so. and you're not going to go to yes. happy hour. <laughs> 
No, I'm, I'm all about yeah. human behaviors. I think that's why I ended yeah. up in the market research industry. She, myself, she's going to so. slip in like a cardboard cutout of herself in front of the camera and then, <laughs> and then go down to the bar. <laughs> no, I'll just end up grabbing a beer or something around then. Then we'll yeah. this will be a You're real welcome conversation. welcome to join us so. with a beverage. That's no problem. Um, yeah, but I just wanted to re- just uh, add on to what Evan said because there's so, so much Jeez. richness in what he just said. Um, what he's pointing mm-hmm. out is... Um, what, what the pandemic what did was, in fact, it did disrupt. There was a lack of change management behind all of that, right? And so that's kind of where some of the shifting and the reconfiguration is going on. So uh, we're all capable of change. People are capable of change. But what we struggle with, where change fatigue comes from, is from our the, the way we manage change. So it's not that we can't change. It's that when change is managed poorly, that's the problem, right? And so um, you talked earlier about humility. I mean, there are organizations, I'm fi- funny enough, I'm writing a chapter right now on hubris for a book that's coming up. <laughs> and the thing is humility and hubris, those are opposites, right? But those can be cultural characteristics as well. So there may be organizations where those become hallmarks or characteristics or um, the, the behind the dynamics within the organizations. And so I've been working uh, with a group, at, you know, and I, I'm going to, I want to tie this back to market research uh, in the sense that um, I am posing, I, I don't know if you guys have heard of the story, three, the three questions. It was uh, written by Tolstoy originally. It was converted mm-hmm. into a children's book. But the three questions in it are, when is the best time to do things? Who is the important one? And what is the right thing to do? And I'll, I'll give you the punchline here. I'm going to spoil the end of the movie. And that is, it all has to do with the present. So when you talk about constantly looking forward or sometimes looking backwards, depending on the people in the organization, we, we fail to pay attention to the present. And that's why the work that I do in culture starts with the baseline of the starting point. So many organizations think, oh, we need culture change. We're going to just start mm-hmm. implementing. And they don't have it any idea about the complexities, the depth, the priorities, the levers that need to be understood in order to do change management. And so that's why the starting point is effectively doing this employee research, which in in your world, it's market research. We're just turning the lens internal to the employees as the consumers or the users, right? And and understanding not only the strengths but the unmet needs within the organizations in priority order with the criteria behind all that stuff never hardly ever gets done as a, a first step when it comes to organizational and cultural change. So this is where this work, the skill set, the anthropologist uh, skill set that Evan, of course, is the expert in, um, it comes into play <laughs> and that we ourselves even and now we can debate this on the academic side is, can we as players within these people systems also be qualified to research it with, I, I personally believe that, yeah, we can be, we can be. So, um, but I'm sure that's debatable in certain circles. So I really do think sure. that um, everything that Evan said is pointing more and more toward, really, I mean, the core of this, I mean, market research and the skill set behind it a can be learned and B can be leveraged uh, for for the and serve the purpose of creating thriving hybrid remote whatever type of workplaces, but the kinds of cultures where both people in the business can thrive. So, yeah. I hope that okay. T- now it's my, to, it's my I, turn. I, to... hope I remembered everything. I was trying to like get on all your points, Evan. It was so rich. Yeah. Well, well, it's time for me to build on on you again. Um, so one of the things you mentioned is that like when when it's been declared by whomever that culture change needs to happen, the fundamental question is like, what does that actually mean, and what are you actually changing? And I do think like looking at those unmet needs uh, is really important. But I think another thing that's important is understanding the like the formal and informal behaviors and interactions that are going on and the 
the momentum and the success of, of the things that have been developed organically and how that actually works. So um, when you talk about looking at the present, like it's a, it's the present of like what we, what we say we're doing and what we're doing in formal settings, but also the things that we're doing informally. And I think there's so much stuff going on right now with the pandemic, with the fact that like, after two years, a lot of really established routines and established behaviors and established interactions have taken hold and are now um, kind of the accepted norm that the you norm, need to, yeah. before, before, before you disrupt again and say, everybody back to the office, you need mm -hmm. to look and say like, but what's, what's working now? I mean, at my company, Conifer Research, yes. we... Um, I would have to look at the numbers, but I would say half of our company, we're a relatively small company, we're about 30 people, um, maybe not half, but, uh, but at least a third started work during the pandemic, which means all they know is yep. pandemic conifer, pandemic culture. Um, and so the move, tra mm -hmm. transporting that back to the office um, would be foolhardy without understanding yeah. what what the effect is going to be, and I, it's not just us. Like we know, um, we know that there's been the great resignation, but there's also been the great hiring. What there has been is a lot of movement. Um, the great I resignation, call it, I think, the great they're yours to lose <laughs> movement. Right, right. Uh, 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 the great the great reshuffling, the great rethinking, the great reflection. But but yeah. really, it, it's about. Um, there's a level of movement that's gone on that is relatively unprecedented in the recent past. But that also means that there are people, a lot of people in the U S who are, and in Canada and everywhere who are, um, who've only known culture as a pandemic phenomenon, wherever they are. And so really mm -hmm. understanding the, what is working about that, um, and what not what may not be recognized as a um, acme practice um, because because the, the other thing is we've it's also anthropology is a reflexive exercise right we look at ourselves and and we look at what we're doing and what we're studying and how and also how people look at their themselves and how they reflect back and understand their own cultures and i think it's really important to look at how are people understanding the pandemic and i think what a lot of people are doing and a lot of companies are doing is they're putting brackets around it as if it's something that um when when we look back decades from now is can, can be removed out of time uh and and somehow like dismissed as aberrant but that's not true. It's something we've all experienced. And therefore, like we need to, um, part of understanding the context is understanding how we are thinking about uh, pandemic work and how we're thinking about our current and future pandemic work behaviors, um, because that's part of the context with which we're going to go forward. Yeah, you know, it is our new, this is the new starting point, right? And mm -hmm. so that's uh, the analogy yeah. I use in my work is it's like a GPS. You know, how do you know how to get there unless you know where you're starting and where you're going, right? And so that's why getting that first step of understanding the present and not just like collecting the data, it's the insights that's important because if you don't have the insights, those insights are the things that are going to shift our thinking and it's going to change our interventions, okay? It's going to change our strategy. It's going to change our planning. It's going to change our... Uh, implementation. It's going to change the way we even sustain it. So I'm just, I'm just trying to think through while you were talking, Evan, uh, is like, what are the insights that, that we can offer in this conversation that will tell people what I, what I mean by that? And that is, um, this is a favor I put in the book. I am overpaid for what I do, but underpaid for what I could do. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that speak mm -hmm. volumes? And so this is an organization, and Evan knows this one, of uh, how do we do talent management? Right. Or um, I just came off of something that, you know, we realized um, it was a DEI initiative. And, we, and of course, um, taking a cultural look at what what was sustaining the current challenges. Just because I'm included doesn't mean like I feel I belong. So if an organization was taking all their efforts into inclusion and and but our research told us, hey, I do feel included. The problem is not inclusion. It's the belonging piece. 
So the fact that we did that research and got the insights means that we have an intervention that we know is going to be relevant and impactful than if we didn't do the research up front. Right. right. So there's so, so much there. Yeah. 